I'll mention just a little bit about uh, what they were doing in, in April and the spring of 1865. I won't cover the funeral train or the Davis escape in much detail now, because it, it's all laid out in the book chronologically, and, and you can see it there. Both presidents leave their White Houses and take to the field. Abraham Lincoln does it first. He wants to see the end. He knows it's coming. So he takes uh, a student book, a paddle boat, and goes to City Point, General Grant's headquarters. Lincoln sees dead soldiers. He sees graves being dug. He visits living and wounded soldiers. He shakes their hand. Abraham Lincoln was so happy when he was in the, with the Army in the field. He really loved the soldiers. He appreciated their sacrifice. Lincoln felt great guilt at sending them into battle to die, and it tortured him throughout the Civil War. He, he did not cavalierly send these men off to battle. Uh, he, did, he was deeply moved by their sacrifices. And most of the soldiers loved him. They chose him over McClellan when McClellan ran against him in 1864. It's the soldiers who came up with the nickname Father Abraham. And so Lincoln becomes almost a newspaper reporter in the field. He's sending telegrams often back to Stanton at the War Department. Uh, if Lincoln was alive today, he would certainly have an iPhone. He would be addicted to the Blackberry. Uh, he would go to the War Department telegraph office at various hours of the day and night and seize things right from the operator's hands. He loved the new technologies, either weaponry or communications. He hears guns firing. He meets with the generals. Lincoln is very excited. He has Tad with him. Mary was there for a while. Uh, then she was returned to the White House, and Lincoln could be alone in the field with his little boy and with the generals. And Jefferson Davis is in his White House, and he knows the end is coming soon, at least the end of Richmond. So he already sends his wife away and children away. He arms her with a pistol. She takes what little money they have, but he won't let her take the food. She wants to go with some wagons of wheat and corn. And Jefferson Davis says, our people are starving. You cannot take food away from the city. They need it. Uh, buy what you can on the road, but you, you cannot take food away. Then on uh, Sunday, April 2nd, he's in church, and the telegram comes from Robert E. Lee, who's been fighting valiantly in the outskirts of Richmond and Petersburg. And the telegram says, the Army of Northern Virginia can't hold out one single day more, not even many more hours, or it will be utterly destroyed. You, Mr. President, have to flee the capital now. Davis is not certain today is the day. Lee sends more messages, essentially saying, no, I really meant it before. You've got to go. <laughs> then another message comes. No, I really meant what I said. You really have to go. Davis writes back, well, we're going to lose valuable property and documents and this and that. And Lee, who liked Davis and got along with him, crumpled up that telegram and said, I am certain that I gave him and then he writes and says, Mr. President, I'm sending an officer to Richmond who will lead you out of the city to the safety of my life. Davis doesn't want to escape that way because he thinks the war is not over. <coughs> Richmond may be done, but the war is not over. He gathers up the cabinet. He loads documents on a train. They load horses and supplies. And they steam out of Richmond on the night of April 2nd, heading for Danville, 140 miles away, which he declares is the new Confederate capital. Uh, Richmond goes wild that night. It burns. People lap the liquor from the gutters. They go mad. They get drunk. They sack the city. And then the Union comes in. Now, the moment, a couple of my favorite <laughs> moments I'll mention. Lincoln enters Richmond on April 4th. Stanton warns him, for God's sake, don't do that. You're, you'll be killed. Uh, Stanton says in so many words, you are the president. It, you, you have no right to go into Richmond. Generals can die, troops can die, you cannot sacrifice yourself. Lincoln goes there with Tad, 12 sailors and Marines and a couple of officers. He walks two miles through the city. Mostly the whites shut themselves in their houses. It's the black population in Richmond that comes out to greet him. Lincoln says, do not kneel to me. You need to kneel to no man. You're free, free as the air. I want to see the Confederate White House. Miraculously, no one shoots at Lincoln. During his walk. Later, he says, Actually, you know, I'm surprised that no one shot me. And <laughs> <laughs> when I walk through Richmond. And he goes and he's taken to Jefferson Davis's first floor study. And he sits in Jefferson Davis's chair. Lincoln doesn't gloat. He doesn't rejoice. He doesn't order vengeance. 
Lincoln says, I'm very tired. May I have a glass of water? And then when the Union general says, what are we going to do with these rebels? Implying vengeance. Lincoln said, General, if I were you, I'd let him up easy. I'd let him up easy. And of course, Lincoln had already adopted the policy. There'll be no arrests, there'll be no trials, there'll be no executions. Lincoln knew that Davis had fled. Lincoln's attitude was, spare me the details, but just if he gets away, he gets away. And don't arrest Lee and all the others. Just let him go home. So Lincoln had already established that policy. But I, I think Lincoln's entry to Richmond is one of the most magnificent moments of his career. And it's really one of my favorite scenes in the book. And I certainly would say that, that prior to the time when President Bush actually walked into the ruins of 9-11 and went with the firemen and stood on that rampart and spoke to the crowd with the megaphone, certainly Lincoln's entry to Richmond uh, was the most dangerous, symbolical visit of any American president to a site of possible danger. And so the assassination comes. I won't dwell on that at all because all of you know that story so well. Uh, what interested me was the things that I didn't know about. I didn't know much about the autopsy of Lincoln. I didn't know much about the embalming. So I really tried to dig deep into those stories and make them centerpieces of the bloody crimes book. And to me, they're deeply moving, very sad, but needed to be told. And I think the, the removal of Lincoln's corpse from Ford's theater to the White House is the saddest moment in the history of the White House. And the image of him lying alone with honor guard in an upper room of the White House while the funeral was planned, other things are planned, uh, was also very moving to me. Then the funeral. Uh, it was a pleasure to discover some documents from the man who actually planned the Lincoln funeral, a great unsung hero, George Harrington, uh, an assistant secretary of the Treasury Department, who knew Lincoln. And to see in his own hand how the funeral of the White House was planned, how the procession was planned. So then there's the moving funeral in the East Room, the procession down Pennsylvania Avenue, and then Lincoln lies in state under the Great Dome. All the while, Davis is fleeing south, Virginia, then North Carolina. Uh, on April 19th, the day of Lincoln's funeral, Davis was in Charlotte, and he learns Lincoln has been shot and killed. This changes everything in the escape of Jefferson Davis. Uh, myth says, Davis said, if it had to be done, better did it be done well, meaning too bad they didn't get Seward. They, too bad they didn't get into Johnson. That is false. Davis did not say that. Um, Davis did not order the assassination. Davis did not plot with the Confederate Secret Service to kill Lincoln. He was quite surprised. But now Andrew Johnson orders a $100,000 bounty and names him as a conspirator in the murder of the president. Then Booth is killed. So it's very likely that Davis might be killed upon his capture either shot or hanged on the spot. It finally ends on May 10, 1865, six weeks later, near Irwinville, Georgia, when Union cavalry patrols intercept the Davis camp and take him, his four children, and about 20 men. His entourage during the long journey had gone from several thousand to 30. Uh, he never chose ever to flee the country. He wanted to go west of the Mississippi, establish a confederacy there with Kirby Smith. And, uh, he never just wanted to save himself, which is exactly why he was captured. He could have easily escaped if he just wanted to get out as quickly as he could. So that's where the book, in principle, ends. Lincoln is taken home to the grave. And the 1,600-mile journey, a million people, including 100,000 children, view the corpse. Seven million watch the train go by. And I think that it's the saddest national moment in our history because it was just not Abraham Lincoln going home on that train. Many northern men had never come home after being killed in battle or dying of disease. And I think the American people felt that on that train coming home with Abraham Lincoln was every father, every son, every brother, every lover, every male relative who had been lost in that war was somehow symbolically coming home with Father Abraham. And I want to quote just briefly and how Walt Whitman sensed that that's what was happening. 
the great poet of the Civil War, and I think the greatest American poet. And that's why uh, Aaron and our friends at the Soldier Stone were kind enough to bring these lilacs tonight uh, as a symbolic proof of just a few sentences I want to read to you to make this point. Whitman wrote, when lilacs last in the dooryard bloom, and the great star early dropped in the western sky at night, I mourn, and yet shall mourn with ever-returning spring. O oh, ever-returning spring, trinity sure to me you bring, lilac blooming perennial, and drooping star of the west, and thought of him I love. O oh, powerful western fallen star, O oh, shades of night, O oh, moody tearful night. And I want to interrupt for a moment and mention that powerful western fallen star. In 1861, after Lincoln was elected, people came out with posters and, and decorated letters and envelopes that called Lincoln the Star of the West, or the Comet of 1861. And so that Comet of 1861 is now the powerful western fallen star. And here's where Whitman mentions the funeral thing. Coffin that passes through lanes and streets with the tolling bells perpetual clang. Here, coffin that slowly passes, I give you my sprig of lilac. Now here's the line. Not for you, Abraham Lincoln, for one alone. Blossoms and branches green to coffins all I bring. And I think Whitman was perceptive to understand that's what the Lincoln funeral was really about. It was a mass national funeral for everyone in the North. Lincoln is in his grave. Davis is in his prison cell. I thought of ending the book there, but the afterlife of Davis is so bizarre and then so fascinating. Uh, how many people would have remembered that Jefferson Davis survived Abraham Lincoln by almost a quarter of a century and had a profound effect later in the history of the South? And I'll, I'll just close by mentioning what Davis did at the end. He was a lost man. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know where to really know how to earn money. He became president of an insurance company. And then a malaria epidemic killed all the customers <laughs> in Tennessee and Memphis. And the, the company went bankrupt. Uh, the death of Robert E. Lee crystallized Davis's vision. Lee had wanted to write his memoirs, but he died too soon. He couldn't finish. That prompted Davis to write to his faithful secretary during the war, Burton Harrison. Quote, it occurs to me that before I am pulled into the grave, I might write a history of the struggle of our people. That led him to sponsor Confederate historical societies, sponsor libraries, sponsor articles, books by other Confederate generals and officers. And simultaneous with that moment of the historical research where the Confederates thought, we may have lost the war on the battlefield, but we're not going to lose it in the books. We're going to write about how great we are, how we should have won. We're going to write about how we were and still are the superior civilization. The, the emergence of the concept of the Confederate dead occurs. And that would be spelled then with a capital C and a capital D. The idea was that this lost army of dead Confederate men and boys, 240,000, was gone, but somehow hovering or watching over the South. And that honors had to be rendered to them, and they had to be remembered. The women of, of the South uh, pursued the cemetery movement, the memorial movement. And Jefferson Davis, in time, came to be seen as the medium between the Confederate living and the Confederate dead. And because of his honorable behavior in prison, because the South knew he didn't try to save his own skin at the end, he became a greater hero to the Southern people in the aftermath of the Civil War than he had ever been as president of the Confederacy, than he had ever been before the Civil War was fought. Near the end, he thinks his life is soon over, he's, in, he's 79, and he gets a little invitation to speak in Alabama at the Monument to the War Dead. And there, Jefferson Davis gives what I think is the most important speech he ever gave in his life. And this really helps cement the myth of the legend of the lost cause. And its importance cannot be underestimated. And I'll just quote briefly from this speech of Jefferson. He's a little surprised that thousands of people seem to be gathering on the way on his railroad journey. Uh, when he gets to the town, uh, 
there are thousands of people waiting for him. And he says to them, you have passed the terrible ordeal of a war which Alabama did not see, a holy war. Well do I remember seeing your gentle boys so small, to use a farmer's phrase. They might have been called the seed corn, moving on with eager step and fearless brow to the carnival of death. And I've also looked upon them when their knapsacks and muskets seemed heavier than the boys. And my eyes, partaking of a mother's weakness, filled with tears. Those days have passed, many of them upon a nameless grave. Now that image of the seed corn, of the southern youth that, that never reached maturity, was already on the verge of getting his audience to, to surrender to its emotions. Then Davis uttered the words that forevermore united the present and the past of this dream of the lost cause. So he says, but they are not dead. They live in memory, and their spirits stand out in great reserve in that column which is marching on with unfaltering step towards our goal, constitutional liberty. I am now standing very nearly on the spot where I took the oath of office in 1861. Your demonstration now exceeds that which welcomed me then. The spirit of Southern liberty is not dead. Then you were full of joyous hope, with the full prospect of achieving all you desire. And now you are wrapped in the mantle of regret. I have been promised, my friends, that I should not be called upon to make a speech. And therefore, I will only extend my heartfelt thanks. God bless you, one and all, men and boys, and ladies above all others, who never faltered in our direst need. Then he sat down. Then the newspaper reporters from New York City, Atlanta, elsewhere, said the crowd burst forth into a roar that they had never heard before in their lives. Some of the reporters said, Dixie is a flame, and no one knows where this will end. Davis went on to give more speeches in two other cities. In one town, 5,000 Confederates came to greet him, and they were told, now don't touch him, don't run up to him, you're going to kill him. He's old and frail. And they re essentially, they disobeyed all orders and recreated Pickett's Charge and stormed the house. <laughs> they waved a Confederate battle flag, and Davis grasps it in his hands and says, I am like this old, tattered flag. I'm so happy to be among you. And they go wild. Marina says, you've got to stop meeting these Confederate veterans because they're going to be the death of you. Uh, you're exhausted after you see them. No more veterans. And Davis says, uh, tell them I am coming because it would be my honor to die in the presence of my Confederate soldiers. Mm -hmm. Then he goes back home to Beauvoir, his, his retreat on the Gulf Coast. And he dies in December 1889. It causes a tumult in the South, a magnificent funeral in New Orleans. But here's where the real legend of him begins. It was always known that he wouldn't be left in New Orleans. Marina would choose, ultimately, his place of final rest. Just before he died, by the way, in his last speech to an audience of young Confederate men and boys near his home, he gave a stunning speech on reunion, on forgiveness, on bringing the country together. We must put the war behind us. The future belongs to you. He's put aboard a funeral train a couple of years later on Marina border, which is a recreation of Abraham Lincoln. It goes from New Orleans slowly through the old states of the Confederacy, chugging its way to Richmond. And just like for Abraham Lincoln, Americans hold up torchlights, signs, some bearing the very language that Lincoln signed. We mourn our fallen chief. He suffered for us. Come home. He arrives in Richmond where there's a tumultuous funeral. Then, later, a couple of years later, when his monument is put up on, on Monument Avenue, 350,000 Southerners and former Confederate soldiers gather in Richmond for the Jefferson Davis Monument. Now bear in mind, 100,000 people in Washington attended the Lincoln funeral. 350,000 people are now in Richmond in 1893 for the Davis Monument. 3,000 school children, like a scene out of ancient Egypt, pull the sculpture forward on 700 foot long ropes and, and, and honor the, the, the sculpture. Uh, on that day, Jefferson Davis's followers thought his name would live forever 
in history as a great American alongside the name of Abraham Lincoln. But as it turned out, the 20th century came to belong to Abraham Lincoln and not Jefferson Davis. And the, the building of the Lincoln Memorial to Cliff Davis, the Northern interpretation of the war certainly eclipsed Davis's interpretation of the war. And so now, as we celebrate the 150th anniversary, or I should say commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, uh, Davis has become what I think this forgotten, it is this forgotten man. I began this book as a Lincoln man, and I end the book as a Lincoln man. But this journey with Jefferson Davis has been fascinating. And I think no one can say, prior to 1861, Jefferson Davis, no one can say that he was not a great American hero prior to 1861. There is, of course, the stain of slavery, which will never leave him or the Southern cause. But you can't not study Jefferson Davis because of slavery, because then you can't study George Washington. You can't study the founders. You can't study a number of presidents. Nor can we study the man who I believe, much more than Davis, is the single greatest hypocrite in American public life, that of course being Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> Jefferson, the man who forever espoused the rights of man, liberty, freedom, the greatest ideals of Western civilization, spouted those ideals on the backs of the labor of his slaves. And, and so, uh, certainly, this is interesting, and I'll close with this. Garrett Smith, the great abolitionist, and a funder of the Secret Six, or one of the Secret Six who, who paid for John Brown's raid at Harpers Ferry, contributed to the $150,000 bail to free Jefferson Davis from captivity for two years. His supporters said, are you insane? This is the guy who led the slave rebellion. He should be killed. You shouldn't pay for him to be released from prison. And Garrett Smith said, slavery is not a Southern crime, I'm paraphrasing now. Slavery is an American crime, of which the North and South are guilty. Wasn't he absolutely correct? And Garrett Smith said the Civil War is not entirely the fault of the South. It's also the fault of the North, and the seeds of it were laid when we founded this nation. Uh, the great American crime was slavery. All the nation was guilty for this. And so that, that was this great abolitionist view of, of uh, the meaning of Davis, the meaning of the Civil War, the meaning of the South. So I certainly think as we begin these 150th anniversary commemorations, we need to study Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln. We need to study the women of the war, North and South, and not just the men who fought the war. We certainly need to study vigorously the slaves, the freedmen, and the 200,000 black men who joined the Union Army and fought bravely for their liberty and the liberty of their people. And we need to study the Confederacy and the Union. And so I don't think any topic should be off limits. There should be no shame in celebrating our ancestors, whether, from, whether they are from North or South. Uh, I think we as a nation should join and remember the Civil War and all of its multiple meanings, and certainly remember at the end that Abraham Lincoln was certainly the greatest president in American history, and in addition, I think, one of the greatest of all Americans who ever lived. And so I just close by saying I can think of no greater honor than to remember Abraham Lincoln on this sad night at a place that brought him much joy. Thank you very much.